Coming up this week on Kings of the Rings podcast, we interrupt this presidential debate to give you all elite furniture. Yes, I'm serious. All elite furniture, even though they may have gotten rid of all the furniture. If you watch all out and seriously, can there be an all out where something bad doesn't happen? AEW is going on a bit of a shit. We're going to discuss all about it. And oh yeah, by the way, the PWI 500 came out, you know, the most talked about list. That means absolutely nothing in the world of wrestling. And oh yeah, Adrenaline in its soul. Cody Rhodes is also getting suits. All of that and more. It's a whole new world. It's a makeover. It's King Ricky and Kayfabe. No, well, ho, ho, ho. This week on Kings of the Rings podcast, episode number 389, exclusively on WrestleMania Radio. And it starts right now. It is really quiet here without Willis. Then it's kind of weird, isn't it? Midnight music. So weird. It is, it is very weird. It's, we're gonna have to. Well, actually, I'm kind of like it. I kind of like it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kings <laughs> of the Rings podcast, episode number three eighty nine. It's a it's a it's a two person show uh, this week. King Ricky and K Fave. Thank you guys for joining us. If you like what you're watching or listening to, please like, share, subscribe. The link to all of our stuff are in the description below. With me. In kind of a, you're, you're now, you're, you're upgraded to like the second chair now. Okay, Fabe, how are you? Wow. Not to brag, but I've been here three weeks in a row. That's a record for me lately. <laughs> that should be your fact that I didn't change from last week, but whatever. <laughs> wow. I don't even get a new fact. Um, <laughs> I'm doing good. Um, the bait's on or coming on I don't actually don't know what time the debate is on I feel like it's coming on at least probably now it's quarter after eight well let's see I thought it was on at eight but then I saw it was on at nine so I'm like confused it's probably gonna be on at nine yeah um it starts at nine. Oh, okay yeah well it's gonna be an interesting show. I don't know how long we're gonna go, but it's gonna be an interesting show, nonetheless. But glad to have you, Kayfabe. We were gonna have another Will, but that other Will had uh, a prior engagement. So it's just myself and Kayfabe for the first time in almost two years. Yeah, I think it's I two think years it's exactly. Two years. Over two years. Jesus Christ. Over two years exactly is the last time me and you did a show together. And I'm really excited for this. We have a lot of interesting stuff We're to overdue. talk we are well we are so well overdue for Ugh. for k and ricky time actually uh we should do we should probably do it more often like i know where you live you're just a pain to get to yeah <laughs> you know but we'll figure it out but so yeah we've got a lot of interesting stuff going on in the world of wrestling the first interesting coming up is something that got released midday today the pwi uh pro wrestling illustrated annual 34th annual 500 list uh they released it or they released released at least the top 10 today for their uh, 34th annual list and lo and behold to no one's surprise cody rhodes is the number one rated wrestler this year again to absolutely no one's surprise that this occurred uh they did release the rest of the top 10 which i'm going to reveal to you now uh i don't want this article sorry about that uh, which is as I move it, move it, move it. Da, 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 da. Fretch dropped that there. Thanks, Fretch, for dropping that in the chat. But I wanted to get to the Twitter page. Uh, the top, the top ten for PWI's 2024. Uh, their top 100. Cody Rhodes at number one. Swerve mm-hmm. at number two. Uh, will that sounds correct? Will Osprey at number three. Arguable. Seth Rollins. Mm-hmm. Seth Rollins at number four. Uh, okay. Tetsuo Naito at number five. Okay. Damian Priest at number six. Okay. MJF at seven. Okay. Always agree. Uh, attempted murderer John Moxley at number eight. We'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gunther at number nine. And, okay. And Mystico, who's uh, Lucha Libre, uh, performed, I believe, in Triple A or CMLI. I don't remember which one, at number 10. So the criteria for this was also explained as well. So the evaluation period for a PWI this year, went from August 1st of 2023 through July 31st of 2024, so about a month or so. They gave themselves about a month or so to kind of figure out what was going on. So in August, obviously, we had Bash in Berlin. We had All In. We had SummerSlam. So all of those things from the last month do not count 
towards Richard's PWI. <laughs> 500. Uh, so the primary criteria was in-ring content as described as win-loss records, championships, and tournaments won. The second criteria was influence, visibility, and prestige within a promotion and or the industry. Uh, another criteria was technical ability, the quality of the moves, quality of matches, and quality of in-ring storytelling. Uh, fourth criteria was competition, which is described as success against the most varied and highest quality opponents. Uh, fifth criteria was also activity, which there was a minimum of 10 Ooh. singles, non-tag, so 10 singles matches total, or barring this, six such matches in separate months. Uh, they also had a note here that said this list prioritizes success in singles competitions and in vying for heavyweight singles accolades and to a lesser extent, those in lower weight classes. So that is the criteria for PWI 500. Uh, the list, like we said, is there. What are your thoughts on this list, k -Fabe? I think it's interesting that I f I'm not correcting if I'm wrong, but I could just be misremembering. But I feel like this is the first time in a long time we haven't seen Roman Reigns in the top 10. I want to say yes. Which I feel like, I'm like something, like this is a very refreshing top 10. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily agree with all the placements. Yeah. But I agree with this top 10 for the most part. Um, like Swerve is absolutely number two. Like he's the top guy in AEW right now. Cody's absolutely number one. Yeah. He literally defeated Roman Reigns after being the champion for like four years. That is number one worthy alone. Mm-hmm. His merch sales are crazy. Like, he's almost universally beloved at this point. Like, yeah, he's come a really long way from us hating him in AEW. <laughs> so, like, everyone loves him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and you look at Cody Rhodes' record. You look at Cody Rhodes' record as they put in the cover here from the past year of their criteria. Remember, like, August of last year to July, end of July of this year. 114 matches with a 95% win loss record. And like they said, one epic story finished. Uh, for, mm -hmm. So for that, so like he he beats all criteria. But even with even with that criteria from August of last year to July of this year, I do kind of find it funny that there is no place in the top ten for Roman at all. It's very interesting to me because he was still the top guy until Cody dethroned him. At Mania, and that's a majority of the year that they that they looked into. I will say that even though Roman has done his best work and is part of the best storyline probably like the last 20 years, mm -hmm. there has still been a sense of bloodline fatigue a little bit for a while. Like I feel like there was a point in like late 2023, early 2024, where like it was just kind of tiring to watch and it was it needed a refresh and i feel like the new bloodline with like jacob fatu mm -hmm. and company like that has rejuvenated the bloodline story like all of a sudden like i feel like there's renewed interest in it yeah. roman was doing his best work but he was in the stale portion of the storyline for most of the year yeah, and I think what hurt him, I think he wasn't as active as he was leading into Mania. That too. He didn't wrestle as much either. Yeah. So you can look into that any other ways you want. And the other instance that I thought about a little bit was Gunther being at nine. I thought he was at least the top five. When you look at the whole body of work, granted, he did not win the World Heavyweight title in this in this year of their criteria because he won it in August at SummerSlam. Um, and after Mania, when he lost in a fantastic match against Sammy, which no one saw coming, he, you know, they kind of had to build him back up. He won King of the Ring, but then after King of the Ring, he was kind of waiting. He was lying in wait till that thing. So I think that went out, that went against him. But I expect Gunther to be a top five by the end of next year's criteria. I agree. He'll definitely be top five next year. I would even dare say top three. It's possible. I mean, I I don't know about Osprey being top three. Like, I look at it. I okay. But I don't. Thank God you said I that just don't I know. The same way. I don't think he's but done I feel enough. Also, I don't feel qualified to speak on it because I don't follow AEW like I used to, and I definitely don't follow Japan like I used to. So I don't feel as qualified to speak on this mm -hmm. anymore. I really enjoyed Osprey this weekend, like overall. Yes, but I can't like. 
I can't speak for how he did the rest of the year. I think it's great that he's crossed over to America finally, truly, mm-hmm. and is on like weekly episodic television. I think he's doing great work. I don't know if it's number three of the year for me. You know what it was for me with Osprey? Um mm. Is that he signed? Because remember, in the beginning of your AW had like a sweep of signings. They signed Osprey, well, yeah, Osprey, Mercedes, and I. There was a third person they signed that I'm totally blanking on right now. And it was kind of like a big thing. We were like, wow, AW is like just throwing money at people at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Hell, even Swerve got a new contract, and honestly, he deserved it after the last three weeks that he has been through. Um, but. They like Osprey signed and then he had to go back to Japan. And so we didn't really see much of him until later on in the year, you know, Mm -hmm. and he, and rightfully so with all the money in the game, he got Scott, he got pushed to the top enough, like feuds. Like he's always going to have a good match. Like he's like, that's Osprey, but I don't know if he had enough good feuds to get number three. I'd have to read what they thought, but like, I just didn't see it from Osprey. I couldn't name another feud he had, but again, that's on me for not watching. Yeah. That's not Will Ospreay's fault. No, it's not at all. And I think his his presence is getting even better. He's really he like I thought I was obsessed with Assassin's Creed. He has just made his whole character based off of Assassin's Creed. Oh. Uh, has he really? Oh yeah. He's got an Assassin's Creed sponsorship now. Good for him. Like, good, that's very I nice. mean, his finishing one of his finishing moves is called the Hidden Blade. Oh, I didn't realize that was an Assassin's Creed reference. Yeah, because in the in the original Assassin's Creed, you could assassinate people by walking up to them and you kind of like shove your wrist in them, and out from your wrist, mm-hmm. like a Spider Man thing, is a blade, and you stab them. So it's a hit, it's uh, called the Hidden Blade. Yeah, so that is an Assassin's it. Creed reference. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Seth Rollins. I look back at it. Seth Rollins deserved it. He fought through an injury, which he should have just taken time off, but he didn't, and he's a psychopath for not taking time off. So I give Seth at four and plus. Seth is the savior of WrestleMania forty. Like Seth is the MVP. Mm-hmm. Seth is the MVP of forty, absolutely without a, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but the list is good. I I feel like the list is a lot more dynamic than it's been in previous years. Mm-hmm. I agree. Like for a while, the list was especially in its inception was heavy AEW, and then heavy WWE. I feel like they finally kind of found like a good balance of like where they can represent all of these different companies. Appropriately. I, think, I think there's I think there's more for, there's starting to be more balance between the two of them. Like AEW's been going on for five years and mm-hmm. obviously we're gonna get into AEW shit tonight. Oh yeah, we are. But like but like they're still like it's impressive that they're five years in and they're you know, next year they're gonna be in Australia, they're gonna I think they're going to Canada, they've done Wembley, like they're doing the overseas thing just as WWE is mm-hmm. doing the overseas thing as well. And that's, I think that's really great for the world of professional wrestling, that there's so much space in the world yeah. to entertain, not just one like televised professional wrestling company, but several. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel that this is the first year that we're really truly seeing a balance in between WWE and AEW. Like WWE is finally getting to a point where like, People aren't hate watching the product right now. Like it's genuinely, truly good. Yeah, it is good. And people are talking about it. Like it's it's like reaching the pop culture lexicon, like the mainstream pop culture lexicon. Like not in like a like a cringy way, or in like a way to be mocked. Like it's getting taken seriously as a sport, and like it's just nice to see that wrestling is like truly coming up on top. Yeah, and that's, I feel like that's a lot to, like, a lot of the work, in particular, I'll use the example of Triple H, and I think the big thing is, is it seems like a little thing, but it's made a massive impact. It's the legacy belts. It's giving out those championship mm-hmm. belts to the winners of professional sports leagues. It's giving championship belts out to sports legends and them carrying around. Like, that has been... Of all the things WWE has done in the last couple of years, I think that's one of the most brilliant marketing schemes I've ever done. Just it's lashing so out. Cool. And, and But, like, people who don't want to proxy, like, oh, they got a custom championship belt from WWE. Like, it just, it brings it back into them. And then they've just been, they have just been crushing it, you know, marketing-wise. And WrestleMania this year was an absolute hit, like, all over the board. Like, it's, they're an inelastic good at this point, I believe. Like, there's... I feel like... 
I feel like wrestling right now, like specifically like mania. I saw a lot of TikToks about how wrestling and WrestleMania is like men, the men's uh, eras tour. <laughs> and, like CM, like CM Punk has said that like he's the he's the Taylor Swift for men. He is. He is. He truly is. Like. But like grown men, like were crying. Like mm-hmm. if you put a video of a woman at the Eras Tour, and you put a video of a man at WrestleMania, like watching Roman lose, like there are, it's the same video. <laughs> it's the same emotions. It's the same feeling. And like wrestling is just truly being like recognized in a legitimate way. Yeah, it's. It is, I mean, we were at Fanatics Fest. Wrestling dominated. Oh my festival. god, wrestling people were like the coolest people at that yeah. festival. The coolest thing about WrestleMania 2, we're going to move on really quickly. The coolest thing about also WrestleMania is that there have been a lot of people who... WrestleMania 40 in particular has had the Avengers Endgame effect, I've noticed on people. Where in particular, it is... It was so good. Like Avengers Endgame was so good and such a big moment in pop culture history that even if you weren't a fan you went to see it and from what i've noticed on the interwebs was that wrestlemania 40 was such a big iconic almost pop culture level moment that there's been so many people who said i haven't watched wrestling while but i heard wrestlemania 40 was unbelievably off the charts i'm gonna go check it out and i have seen I saw there's a particular woman on YouTube who never saw wrestle, never watched professional wrestling in her life, was said she went to like a WrestleMania party and for the first time with her husband and went to see it and immediately fell in love and is now like a weekly fan. Wow, that's so great. Yeah, it was really funny because she made a video. I have to find the video on YouTube for her. She made a video talking about her experience of watching WrestleMania 40 and she like the first match of 40 was Rhea and Becky. And when she saw Rhea came out, she was like, Oh my God. <laughs> she was like, I think I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that happens to a lot of women. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that's what I, that's where I think WrestleMania is at. It's getting that level, like, especially WrestleMania 40, where it's just like, it just pulled you in. And that's what WrestleMania is supposed to do. But I think it actually succeeded this year in a it wild did. level. Uh, so yeah, Cody, PWI 500, PWI, I've looked at the rest of the list. I know one of the alumnus of the show, PB Smooth, uh, was 342, so he's he's moving up there. Yay, congratulations. Yes, he's an NWA Midwest champion right now, PB Smooth. Uh, so congratulations to him, uh, getting the 342, so he's moving up in the world. I'm very, very proud of him. Moving on. Speaking of Cody Rhodes, <laughs> he's getting sued. Okay, so I'm gonna have to paint the picture for you here, Kay. So, oh, I'm ve- okay. I'm like very abreast of this because Liv listens to the band in question. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Okay. All right. So let, let's paint the picture for for the audience here. <laughs> um, so Cody's moniker is named American Nightmare, and he wanted to get it, you know, trademark, copyrighted, whatever, whatever. Unfortunately, he couldn't because there is a band from Boston that was formed in 1996 with the name American Nightmare already. Cody Rhodes obviously started using the American Nightmare moniker around 2018-ish, uh, something like 2018, 2019, something like that. So... Him being aware that this was already kind of trademarked and taken, he had to strike a deal to use the American Nightmare name. Uh, the American Nightmare band is still touring. They last toured in 2023. And according to the original agreement, Cody, again, obviously gave some sort of monetary amount. I think it was like 30 grand or something like that. And as part of the agreement, Cody could use American Nightmare. The only stipulation was that any merchandise that Cody used the American Nightmare moniker on... um Essentially, any iconography, anything resembling Cody Rhodes, any wrestling-related imagery had to be at least 75% bigger than the words American Nightmare on the merchandise. So it had to be, the focal point had to be the design, not the typography. Correct, yes. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. I feel like that's very reasonable. Yes, and so now the band or whomever on with the name American Nightmare is suing WWE, Cody Rhodes, uh, and Fanatics for essentially, you know, 
uh, breach of not breach. I guess it's breach of contract. You know, stating that, you know, their merchandise breaks the agreement that was previously set in stone. And they're looking for upwards of close to, besides the damages and the legal fees, upwards of like 500000 Okay. Um, From what I've seen, and I have a bunch of American Nightmare-like stuff, I'm no, I haven't seen them break that rule in any of the merchandise. I I did actually. Did you? I think it was like a it was like a pair of shorts or something. Let me find it. Because <laughs> I was watching something about this, and there's something on WWE's website, and it was like I don't remember if it was sh- men's shorts or like a bathing suit or something. Really? Like, yeah, it was. The way it kind of looked to me was: Do you remember the shot, the shorts in the 2000s with like, the words on the butt? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> they was like these men's like shorts that say like American Nightmare really fucking big. On the on the, on the rear end portion? No, on the like on the front on the crotch part. Oh, that's a weird place to put it, but I get it. Yeah. Let me see if it's still on Fanatics website. Because I know on the shirts, I haven't seen them really break that at all. Because Cody's shirts are always really, I'm, I you probably know this too. A lot of her shirts are really like it's American Nightmare somewhere, but like that's not the focal point of a shirt at all. It's always like a yeah. Skull. Looking at one, the skull's in the middle. Like it says American Nightmare around the skull in a lot of these shirts, or it's like the back. It's the back logo on a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Let's keep scrolling. Jesus, this is some ugly fucking merch, though. Some of this stuff is good. Some of this stuff is bad. <sighs> I also have a thing for skulls, so I'm kind of like. No, I love skulls. So, so there's skulls all over my house. But like, this is ugly. This is like, I like Cody, love you. (laughs) Merch, please. Like, I understand that this is this, this merch is for someone. Yeah. (laughs) This is not for me. Oh, here. I found them. They're boxers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, I see it. That'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. They're huge. Yeah, Yeah, they kind of screwed up there. All right, so they're caught. (laughs) Like, they're caught. I mean, I'm I'm interested to see how much this drags out. Obviously, I think Fanatics and WWE will cover it. Probably more so Fanatics, because I think this is a Fanatics issue. More so than is a WWE and Cody issue. Probably. Uh, I feel like WWE and Cody would be very on top of that. Yeah. So, Whereas Fanatics, I'm noticing that like they're just putting WWE like they're making ever anything merch. Pretty much. They're just pumping but stuff there's out. There's a wider variety. Yeah, they're just pumping stuff yeah. out. So I, I don't know what happens, but we'll we'll see what happens with that. We'll monitor it. But it's it's something interesting. Within the last week, Cody Rhodes has gotten sued and is also the number one wrestler in the world by PWI. So congratulations to Cody. Gotta love a good work life balance. Yeah, right. Gotta love it. Um speaking of work life balance, I think WWE has finally heard all of our calls and cries for we like, I don't know, the entire life of this podcast <laughs> and beyond. So according to WWE confirmed by WWE starting in October through the rest of the year. Monday night raw is two hours long from 8 PM to 10 PM. God, it's a good day. (laughs) So here's a couple of things that we need to consider. Remember when all of these deals kind of went in play for WWE, the TV deals were all going to Netflix, SmackDown, leaving Fox, going back to USA, NXT, going to the CW, which is all predicated on the fact that those deals, for the most part, were all going to start in October or the current deals were ending in this current October. Specifically for Monday Night Raw, their deal with USA Network ended in October and they made that deal for Mm -hmm. Netflix to start in January of 2025. So we had always talked about there was going to be a gap period that they had to find a way to find something to do with Raw. They obviously kind of came to some sort of agreement with the USA Network to cover Raw into that transition period into Netflix. Um, and I think it's mostly to do with Peacock as well. And there is some money involved. I don't think they were willing to shell out money for that extra hour if they're just kind of holding it over until it goes over to Netflix. Mm-hmm. So I think that is the real story behind this 
is that it's not that they wanted to go to three hours or two hours from three to two. It's that they had to go to two hours because there wasn't they weren't going to get the money for the third hour. Well, no matter what the reason is, we're winning. <laughs> we all get to sleep a little bit better on Monday nights. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Mondays are my Sundays, so like staying up on until eleven o'clock on a school night is not very fun. <laughs> that no, it's very true. The interesting thing about this here as well is that there is no guarantee that they will return to three hours when they go to Netflix. There is no guarantee that it will remain at two hours when they go to Netflix because Netflix is a streaming service. They don't really have to rely on commercials. There might be raw on a week to week basis when it goes to Netflix might have an inconsistent time frame depending on what's happening that week. Oh. Like think about that. Cause remember, like a lot of raw, like if you were to remember when you used the Hulu Raw, it goes from three hours to about an hour and a half. Yeah, they cut a lot of because out. a lot of it is based on commercials. So I think it's going to fluctuate like Sir Charles says. Hey, Sir Charles. Um, I think it is going to fluctuate between two and three hours when it goes to Netflix. It's not going to be a straight like runtime all the time because they, they have the luxury of not having to deal with commercials. I'm so not mad about that at all. You know, it, it's going to be interesting uh, how, how it's going to work out. Because remember, in the Netflix and the streaming service, depending on your tier, you either pay for ads or you don't pay for ads. So like the ads are kind of yeah. built into the service, especially if there's going to be replayability of these episodes on Netflix as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so which means I, which reminds me I have to re up and actually go back to Netflix. I canceled it this year. <laughs> um, I feel like Netflix is like that one streaming service that's like I will continue. I yo yo between having an, one of us has a membership or we cancel it. Yeah. Until something comes out. Yeah. So it, it's going to be interesting because there's going to be a library of raw episodes. I mean, there's gonna there's going to be so it, it's gonna be interesting to see what they do with Monday Night Raw but I like it I like going to two hours it's gonna be interesting to see how that two hour format goes uh, as I was talking to um a, a Hall of Fame friend of a the show they were specifically talking about it's gonna really like it's gonna be shitty for the roster because you lose an hour of TV yeah. a week yeah, so a lot of people aren't going to get featured as much, but that just means they have to be a lot more intentional with the stories they tell. Yeah, and it's it's a you know it's, what they televise. It's a positive and a negative. So like the you know your times a little bit more precious. They go from on a week basis, you know they went from they're going to go from three to seven hours to six. Each show will be two hours. Mm -hmm. AW, but I wonder. Sorry, no, AW has I uh, wonder, five. Yeah. And that feels like so much. Yeah. I feel like I wonder if that WWE is going to kind of rely on like X or like Instagram to kind of supplement the the wrestlers that we're not seeing as much. Kind of like the 24-7 title. Remember, that could be defended anytime, anywhere. I mean, we do have the speed championship, which is defended that on That too. X. That's like an X exclusive. Yeah. Like, I wonder if they'll do stuff like that more. To give up people other opportunities. Potentially. Because, I mean, they're all going to be in front of a live audience. You know, no matter mm -hmm. what. It's just a matter of, like, when it debuts on the streaming sites. So, we'll, we'll definitely see yeah. what happens. It, it is a very interesting thing. But when that raw two hours, we've asked for this. We're all going to get it. And I bet you it's been about three weeks' time. We're probably going to hate it. Because <laughs> that's how the... Not me. That's, I know not you. But that's how the wrestling cycle usually goes. Speaking of wrestling cycles, we're going to play a brand new game for a brand new segment of, of, of this oh. show. But not just yet. Because we have to talk about all elite furniture. <laughs> yes, folks. <laughs> It was revealed early, early la or late last week that All Lead Wrestling has partnered with Zipchair to have officially licensed, as it says here on the ad, AEW Dream Seat Furniture, office chairs, uh, couches with cup holders or a little lounge chair with a cup holder, you know, uh, and and uh, looks like a bar stool as well with you know AEW or AEW Collision or AEW Dynamite on like the the headrest. Of of this furniture, kayfabe. Will you will you be getting one of these all elite furnitures to do an all elite home makeover of your apartment? 
Absolutely, I will. I'm going to trash all of our furniture that I have spent the last year and change curating to do all elite furniture in my home. See that WWE chair behind me? Gone. It's all elite furniture, baby. Listen, I want, I, I know we talked about this uh, in the Discord. I said, I want everything they do to have AEW all elite furniture on any furniture that's ever used on their TV and under pay per views. Like the office chair has to be an all lead office chair. The announce tables mm-hmm. have to be all lead announce tables. Like I want that branding Edward. Like if you're going to take this deep dive into this, like the, the, the contract chairs that they use have to have AEW branding on it when they do contract signings. Like I want to see it everywhere. <laughs> I can't believe they're doing this. Fred said the prices are crazy too. What is, I have not looked up the price at all. Whatsoever. The rec- I think the recliner was like, I know something was at least eight hundred dollars. It's see. probably the recliner. It's definitely because of the two cup holders. All <laughs> elite. It's all furniture. Yeah, it's on Zipchair, Zipchair.com or awshop.com. That just sounds like a fake website. What Zipchair? Does. Yeah, it does not sound. I mean, I, I see it's a real website. It's just the name. Yeah. What? Okay. What are we looking the, at? All right, the recliner is on sale for from eight fifty to seven ninety nine. Um, the video game floor chair is on sale. It's two oh nine ninety nine on sale from two twenty nine ninety nine. The office chair is everything's on sale. The whole store is on sale, but it just um, came out. Yeah, but that's how they get you. <laughs> that's what Amazon does. Amazon makes their prices higher. And crosses it out. It says it's on sale and puts it to the price it used to be to make you think it's on sale. Happy Prime Day, kids. Happy Prime Day. The couch is $1,619.99. So there's a full flooded, like like a loveseat couch? No, there's a fucking... Um, there's a love seat and there's a couch and there's like dining room tables. Shut up. I thought it was tables, a chair. I, was, I know the there's chairs. Bar stools. Jesus. There's bar stools, chairs. There's a love seat. Oh my God. This is fucking crazy. <laughs> oh my God. This couch, what's fucking crazy is my couch is bigger than this AW couch and costs less than this couch. That's just, I gotta go on this website and see all of this furniture. Like, this is kind of nuts. This couch doesn't even look like it has fucking cup holders. Like, <laughs> what good are you? Yes, all elite furniture. Get yours today soon. And I don't know, Sir Charles, if they do you have an affiliation with Zipcar. If Zipcar still even exists. It does exist. Does it really? We use it all the time. Yeah. Oh, there, there you go. Well, that makes sense for you because, you know, you're in a more urban in an urban setting more than I am. Yes. <laughs> and everything like that. All right. So, okay. Now you're ready for the, the new segment that we're going to do. And yes. I'm glad I'm doing this segment with you. Uh, it's a segment where we're going to highlight something that may make us actually cringe when we talk about it. And I called this segment. Now that's what I call yikes. Oh, <laughs> I think I know what we're talking about. Yes. Now that's. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'm, we're here to talk about what uh, a, a very interesting topic from this past week in the world of wrestling. And that is AEW. All out. AW All Out, we mentioned last week, was like the WrestleMania backlash to their WrestleMania. And after the success of All In, especially in my opinion, I thought it was a very good show, you know, with some minor uh, hiccups here and there. I thought they were in a good run. I started watching AEW a lot more consistently in the past couple of weeks. And All Out had a pretty decent build to it um, and everything. Shut up, Charles. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah i knew that I mean, k is like turning beet red now at the moment as well you just made their night by the way charles uh aw all out had a pretty pretty decent build to it you had a couple of good marquee matches uh they added okado's in a fatal four-way for the continental championship the young bucks are in a tag team title match uh you had osprey versus Pac, who actually tore the freaking house down 
with their match. Uh, Ricochet still can't cut a promo. <laughs> oh my God. Ricochet. <laughs> That's a, we're, not, we're not even kidding about. We're not even going into that as well. Mercedes did what Mercedes does. Nothing really special there, to be completely honest with you. Um, and then and then we got to the bigger marquee matchups, which was the actual main event, quote unquote main event, uh, Brian Danielson versus Jack Perry. Decent match for all intents and purposes. Obviously, the stipulation is if Brian ever loses the AEW World Championship, he will have to retire full time or whatever that is. Um, and he won the match. There weren't really that many shenanigans involved in the match. Uh, but then after the match is over, we saw Luchasaurus, aka Killswitch, come out. It looked like he was going to help Jack Perry, but it was kind of all smoke and mirrors as uh, as Christian Cage came out because Christian Cage won a match at All In, which pretty much is equivalent to WWE's Money in the Bank, where he can challenge for AEW World Title anytime, any place, anywhere. So Christian Cage and the Patriarchy came out about to essentially cash in his little contract to face a very tired Brian Danielson into uh, into another match where he was more than likely going to lose. However, Brian Danielson's friends in the Blackpool Combat Club, uh, John Moxley, who's actually looking really, really fit these days in good shape and healthy uh, and very in, you know, shaved head and everything, uh, as well as Pac and uh, Claudio, and Wheeler Yuta came out to stop the patriarchy, and the patriarchy backed off. And they brought Brian Danson back in the ring, Blackpool Combat Club, all five of them, raising hands in the air, you know, celebrating Dan- Brian Danielson's victory. And out of fucking nowhere, Claudio uppercutted the absolute shit out of Brian Danielson. <laughs> Much to the shock of the crowd. Uh, Wheeler Yuta does his best acting, seeing like he's watching his best friend die, because actually, almost, his best friend almost died. Um, yeah. So, it seems like a typical betrayal. They're kicking him out. This is going to start a new feud with Brian Danielson. They're going to beat him up. And then, for some unknown reason, John Moxley takes a plastic bag and covers Brian Danielson's face with it in a literal attempt to to suffocate him to death on a pay-per-view in front of a live audience. And that bag was on Brian Danielson's head for a very extended period of time, so much that when he finally let go, Medical group came out with an oxygen tank, meaning this was a planned thing that they were going to do, knowing the risk of what is going to happen, what might happen to somebody with a loss of oxygen, especially somebody with a loss of oxygen who has a prior history of head and neck injuries. Mm -hmm. And they still went through with this. Um, And my initial thoughts was like, I get it. The beatdown starting up a next feud. Great story. And then this becomes a theme at AEW. They took it one step too far. It was so shocking and jarring. The Chicago crowd started chanting, this is murder. That was, I'm not going (laughs) to lie. I did laugh at the this is murder chant. Yeah. Because I've never heard that in my life. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen like anything like this. Yeah. I mean. Just the entire end of it. This the last two matches of this pay-per-view overall. Absolutely. I mean, Mox is known, the character of John Moxie is known for being a bit of a psychopath, deathmatch guy, uh, you know, doing a lot of crazy stuff, but to and there's ways you can do death matches where it looks bloody, it looks gruesome, and all of that stuff, and that's fine. But to literally try to take someone's oxygen away in the middle of a ring, and like I looked at that like the he, there was no there was no holes like this was a literal suffocation um again to the point where the medical team or the medical team came out with an oxygen tank for him like this was a planned extremely dangerous stunt that i don't think they needed to do to get the point across what are your thoughts Kay? i feel like this is how i know i feel like i'm like in my 30s <laughs> and like my frontal lobe is developing yeah. like i am not 
I don't like I don't get grossed out or like squeamish from gore very easily. But as someone that like has garbage lungs, I don't know, the suffocation for me was too much. I'm like, this is too much for me. Like, (laughs) give me tax, give me blood, fine, whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't know. I like that Mr. Fretz pointed out that Brian hates plastics. And I feel like that's an even like sicker layer that I didn't even like think about. (laughs) I was just so focused on the breathing aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But this is where I'm going to be a little old for a second. Like, yeah, AEW is more of an adult show, but like kids still do kind of watch AEW probably a little bit. Yeah, especially teens. And well, I'm not so much worried about like teenagers doing this so much as like maybe like like later elementary school and like early middle school Mm -hmm. watching a paper, uh, a plastic bag stunt. Like that's an easily accessible object Yeah, in anybody's house. Like anybody could try to practice that spot with their sibling or their friend right now, if they wanted to. Yeah. It's just, uh, I, I was very uncomfortable with it. Obviously with Daniel, with Brian Danson's medical history as well. And, you know, loss of oxygen to the brain is, very bad. Like I've worked with people in my real life who have traumatic brain injuries, and this is one way to get them. Um, yeah, you know, and it, it's really a shame because, like, like our co-host will always says, Daniel Bryan wants to die in the ring, or Brian Danson wants to die in the ring, and he's no, truly, yeah, he's getting he's there, he's getting really close. That's his goal is to die at AEW. Yeah, and I, I, it's, it's annoying. Like the more that he like. The more he tries to do these things, the more I'm just like, dude, you have, I think you guys, what, two kids now? Yeah. We always forget the second uh, we, we always do, because everybody talks about Birdie. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, what are you doing? Like, what are you What are you trying to prove? It's one of those things when, I remember back when AEW first started and Cody, t- and Sean Spears knocked the crap out of Cody with a chair shot. And we were like, oh, my God, I remember that. And we were like, what are you doing? Like, you're an EVP of the of the company. Like, what what are you trying to prove to the boys in the back? Like, that's you're the guy. Like, we already know you're the guy. You founded the company. <laughs> like, is it like a my dick is bigger sort of situation? I, I honestly like, don't know. But I, I don't get that energy from Daniel Bryan. I I, I don't know. I, I don't. But get I guess. That, yeah. From what I have understood about men in my time around men, mm-hmm. men get weird about weird things. This is true. Especially with like, you know, like retiring is is like a form of vulnerability. Like mm-hmm. you're kind of by retiring, you're admitting you can't go as hard anymore. Yeah. Even though Brian is like, yeah, he's retiring for the benefit of his family. Nah. There's still a like a What's the word I'm looking for here? Like, he's setting aside his health, like, his career for his family, which is fine. But he's, like, giving up his, like, livelihood and, like... It's all he knows. Very, and it's hard for him to get yeah. rid of. It's hard, I understand it's hard for you, to, hard for somebody to change them. That's the only thing they've known and the only thing they've ever wanted to be. And there is a... There is a grieving period that you would have to go through from a therapeutic standpoint for this loss of this life that you had for oh so long and a part of that grieving period and you know from a therapeutic perspective again part of that grieving period is when you even grieve a death of somebody or a breakup is you now have to re uh reconstruct your mind to realize that there is a reality and there is a future without that the preconceived notion of what you already had yeah and I think that, and I totally understand. Yeah, that. and I think that's I think that's the I think that's the real life issue that Brian Danielson is going through. That he cannot see a life without wrestling, without pro wrestling. Because even it even went from I'm retiring to I'm retiring from a full time basis. So there is still a possibility that he will always yeah. come back, which he doesn't need to. I could, I could see him coming back for like a pay per view. Yeah, here and there, like it's it's just still I, always harder to yeah, do it br- part time than it is full time. He can't quit wrestling. Like, like he in his soul, even if he's gonna not re- like wrestle every week anymore, and he's gonna he's gonna wrestle full time until he drops his title. Yeah, and then after he drops his title, he's gonna 
probably disappear. But what he also doesn't, at least on TV or anything, like kayfabe doesn't seem to consider is that like you can have a career and a life in wrestling outside of the ring. Yeah. Like, look at all the great work Jason Jordan has done producing WWE since his career ended. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he his career ended, he was young. Yeah. Like, very young. Yeah, he had a, he had a, he, he was, he had a lot of potential. They, there was a lot of promise in him as a singles competitor. Yeah. And it just didn't happen. But I don't, yeah, it's one of those things where Dana Brand has to realize that there's a future outside of the ring. And you can be very happy with that future outside of the ring. But he, he, yeah, and like not for nothing, we're not always meant to stay at the same job forever. This is true, Daniel Bryan. Yeah, like it's okay. Yeah, and I, I, I hope somebody's telling him that. I really hope. And if this, and, and yeah. if that was the only thing we're going to talk about all out, I'd be happy. However, AEW's actual main <laughs> event was arguably their best storyline that they've ever had since the inception of the company: Swerve versus Hangman Page. Uh as we know, this was going to probably main event. It's the best story that they've had after All In. It is uh, a feud that's been going on since Wrestle Dream of last year. Uh, they put on Ooh. absolutely fantastic, brutal matches, and it's very it when a very it's a blood feud at this point. It's a blood feud. Um, it ramped up last week <laughs> after our show when. Swerve had legitimately revealed that with his new contract, he was able to rebuy his his uh, childhood home, which is an absolutely mm-hmm. like cool thing to do. Like if I it made yeah. me think like if I ever had that money, maybe I would do the same thing. I had that dream for a long time, too. You know, it would be a really like cool thing to do. And so very rightfully so, AEW in a brilliant storyline dynamic took that and had Hangman Page kayfabe burn the house, which was a fantastic move. Like brilliant, absolutely brilliant storytelling. It ramped it, it ramped this feud up to 11. It was probably at 11, probably ramped it up to 15. They're in a cage match. Um, and because Hangman did not sign the contract because he was too busy burning down Swerve's childhood home, it turned into an un- it turned into an unsanctioned match. However, AEW has to be different for the sake of being motherfucking different, and they called it <laughs> <laughs> and they called it a lights out unsanctioned cage match. And for all of you guys who do not who aren't aware of what a lights out unsanctioned cage match is, it's an unsanctioned cage match. But here's the lights out part about it: AEW does. AEW will say, "Hey, our show." quote unquote is ended. We're going to turn the lights out. And when the lights come back on anything that happens, we are not liable for, but we'll broadcast it for you. (laughs) That's what the lights out is. Like it's one of those things where it's like, it is good in theory, bad in practicality, (laughs) like good in theory, bad in practicality. So we have this lights out unsanctioned cage match and it's as brutal as you think it is. And, there are and more. Yeah, there are staple guns. Uh, there are chairs. There are tables, and it's telling a fantastic story. They've used staple guns before, so no one's surprised by this. Um, they've used staple guns before, um, and it's a brutal match as it should be. The only way you can win in the cage match in AEW rules is you cannot escape the cage, although there is a door. Uh, you cannot escape the cage in any way, shape, or form. It has to be pinfall submission or TKO if necessary. And well, they went the TKO round and we'll get there. Um, and they're telling a fantastic story. It's the only, ma- it's the only match on the card that should have actually had blood. I thought there were a couple of matches that didn't need blood um, at all. Mm-hmm. This the one actually deserved it and earned it. Uh, based on what they've been doing. They're telling a fantastic story. I started getting concerned when the cinder block came out. Oh my God, the cinder block spot was nasty. The thing with the cinder block, and I like, I started really focusing on the cinder block because there are stunt cinder blocks you can acquire for spots that they were going to do. And they Mm -hmm. didn't do that. That was a real cinder block. That they used multiple times on both opponents. Swerve got not to sound stupid. How do you know? Hmm? Not to sound totally stupid, but like, how do you know? How do you know what? That it was legit. 
the fact that it didn't break when they power bomb swerve on it. That thing should have sat. I mean, if they were using a stunt I one, feel, I feel like there's always potential for a stunt or like a prop thing to go like not work fair. for like you, you know. I, t- I didn't even can think either way. Yeah, I I was that it might have been a stunt. I just assumed it was real. Yeah, I mean. It was obviously a planned thing, but I was like, we we couldn't have gotten like a like a softer cinder block. Like there are, we've seen them used, I think, before in like wrestling where you use a cinder block, but like breaks a little bit easier. And this one didn't break at all, and it just seemed like I was like, I don't know if that was worth the risk for because like it's not only the power bomb on us, it's a power bomb to the man's lower back, <laughs> like that's like it's paralyzing. Like you could like yeah. yeah, like and the fact that it didn't like, why break. Are we fucking yeah. Why are we fucking with people's health like this? Like, I get this is wrestling, but like, I think we're doing too much for the sake of doing too much. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of okay with the center block spot because, like, I was like, all right, not that worse, not that bad of damage. Like, they got lucky, it looked like. Um, but all of this for like essentially your number one guy in the company. And it's not MJF, it's Swerve. <laughs> you know, Swerve's mm-hmm. the no- number one guy in the company. He has blossomed. Mm-hmm. He's blossomed in the past year in AEW. Uh, absolutely blossomed and they kept on going after the cinder block spot and then the interesting spot is that we had hangman had a black like sack a black like sack and he brought out a burnt piece of wood from from the house that he burned down so again Mm -hmm. this is great storytelling beautiful storytelling and they're battling over the piece of wood. Who's going to hit the other one? Blah, 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 blah. And they finally had the resolution to that. And in my mind, from a storytelling perspective, this should have ended the match. Like you elevated yeah. to a point of like, now we're fighting over the house. We have a piece of the house, blah, blah, blah. Whoever wins, wins it. And that, that didn't end the match. And again, this is where like, hey, we had a logical ending. Now we're going to take it a step further. Why? No one fucking knows. It started getting cringy and yikes for me, Kay, um, because I mentioned this before about Hangman. Hangman's character is very not. An, it's it seems like it's influenced of a very old school racist from the sixties and seventies. Like he, he has that yeah. he has that vibe to him. I don't know if that's what he's going for. Like obviously he's a man who's kind of down on his luck and is like kind of going mad. Uh, but but is, is that a side effect of being from the South? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Someone that's never lived in the South, like, I can't speak yeah. to how one might behave if they're losing everything in their life yeah. and their mind. Yeah, I just... No. It started getting weird to me because he's always kind of had that those undertones. Like he he's one misstep away from saying the N word on live TV. Like that's who I feel like with Hangman Page. Um, oh God, he is. But you, it started scaring. So he's beating up Swerve, and Swerve's kind of like he's on his knees, kind of got his head down, and he, like Hangman gets goes up right next to him and starts saying, "Beg for mercy, beg for mercy." I'm like, oh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> you know, like in storyline, I get it, but like just seeing it as kind of like an outside, I'm like, oh, it's kind of it's it's mm, it's unsettling. And for a lot, yeah. And for a lot of that match, you could even tell the crowd was very unsettled by what they were watching. Like for a Chicago mm-hmm. crowd, they were very silent. They picked it up at the end, you know. But for a lot of that match, the crowd was like, "I don't know if we should be watching this." Like it was a, it was a, it was an awkward feeling in, in the crowd. So he says, "Baker, baker, me." He goes back to the pat. He goes back to the sack, and. And he pulls out a legitimate hypodermic needle. Okay. Yeah. I, that's the same thing I said. Okay. <laughs> he pulls out a hypodermic needle. No, thanks. I know. And sticks it on the inside. He took out Swerve's caps. Is there his gold caps? He sticks it on the inside of Swerve's mouth and just leaves it there. And the thing on the hypodermic needles in and of himself, I was talking about this with who was going to be our host uh, this week, but he wasn't able to make it because he actually, long story short, he wanted me to be on his show on Sunday. I was like, I haven't watched All Out yet. He goes, I can't, we, we can't do it then. So I ended up talking to him about it after I watched it. The thing about it is when I think of the hypodermic needle, 
and this might be the generational trauma speaking as a black man, um, I think of the 1980s, 90s war on drugs and the welfare queen mm-hmm. and all of those things that it was targeted to and specific people of color that it was targeted against. And, you know, the... Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, stop and frisk of the 90s in New York City and all of those those targeted things that were supposed to be done in good faith. But we all know what it actually what actually occurred. And then seeing that mm-hmm. done to Hangman Cage, their most prominent, their only the most prominent African-American performer, their mo- their only African-American world champion they've had in their infantile history, which is, again, a, uh, something that AEW needs to be commended for because it took it, it took mm-hmm. WWE 50 years to pull that off. Um, yeah, and then to see and then to see the needle go through his go through his uh his cheek, I was like, why? Like, one, it's unsettling, and especially with there was uh in the 80s of like when Abdul the Butcher was running wild, they had a hepatitis C outbreak. So, like, are we just not paying attention Mm -hmm. to the history of (laughs) the history of wrestling and what and how bad needles were for for people? Um, and if that was the end. I would have, I would be, you know, I would have concerns, but it didn't end at all. With the needle in Swerve's cheek, just, just hanging there, Hangman Page then takes the chair in the ring and with Swerve's hands down on his knees as he's in the middle of the ring, Hangman Page unloads an unprotected chair shot to Swerve's head Probably the hardest chair shot I've ever seen in my time of watching pro wrestling. And it was crazy. Yeah. He got hit so hard in the head, the chair broke completely. And and I'll end the match was over because obviously no one gets fucking up from that. No. <laughs> you know, and I don't understand. For the life of me, why you had to go that route. Like, I understand story-wise, it is a man who will feel like he's lost everything. This guy has been tormenting him, stalking him, ruining his life, ruining all of his opportunities. Although, that's the Hangman Page character. Hangman Page is always his worst enemy. He wins the AEW world title. He's on top of the world. He loses it, and then he loses his mind. You know, that's the Hangman Page story of AEW for its entirety. Um... But I don't know why this was completely necessary. This felt to me like it was a stunt for the sake of doing a stunt. Um, It felt to me like we were violent for the sake of being violent. And it also feels like, is there any... Is there anybody looking out for the safety of the performance? Like, who is green? I mean, no, it's Tony at the end of the day. But who's greenlining all of this? Do they not have agents? Are they just... Are they just going to Tony? It's like, okay, do whatever you want. Like, it just seems very lawless. Um, it's lawless, it's reckless, and it's also one of the reasons why at this current point in time, AEW will never be bigger than WWE. Because they're gonna end up no. they're gonna end up screwing up so badly, and they've got to close so many times. Look at Matt Hardy, look at Sammy Guevara, look at Cody Rhodes, now Swerve and Hangman. Like, they are going to screw up so badly one day, and they've gotten so lucky. For these last five years, that nothing catastrophic has happened. Even with um, even with um, Huber dying, you know, it wasn't related to anything that went on in AEW. They've gotten so lucky in that aspect, but their luck is running thin. And I am, it just it was concerning because like, and I know I'm ranting, Kay, and I apologize, <laughs> um, but you're all yeah, good. AEW, I felt had so much good um good PR coming out of all in they were real they're really high people start to reinvest in AEW especially me and the, you know I was very not investing the fact in, that you yeah. fucking got caught up in AEW says a lot yeah and then I was like and then it was like and then you pull this and I was like oh why not you know how bad it got Jonathan Coachman Went on a rant on X <laughs> or Twitter. Oh, God. What did he, he say? He literally said, have we not learned anything in the last 20 years of pro wrestling? And he's absolutely fucking correct. Like, we, we all know better as a society from the NFL concussion stuff, from all the other things going on. Um, 
from all the other, you know, concussion things going on in all the other sports, we know how bad this is. And to even attempt something like this, I don't care if it was gimmicked or not, that you shouldn't have come close to that at all. Yeah. <laughs> like it just, ugh, it was just, it makes you like really rethink, like, do you want, like, do you want to continue down this route, AEW? But I don't know. Okay. I, I ran it for a while. What are your thoughts on the whole thing? Um, my biggest takeaway about the differences between all in and all out is I feel like all in was the Barbie movie and all out was Oppenheimer. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good analogy. Just blew up. Like everything. All, <laughs> no, like this was such a heavy fucking pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. It's a shame because like, it was a good pay-per-view. It was a really good pay-per-view, but I feel, and like, this is how I feel like I know I'm getting like old, or like, or how my perception of wrestling is changing, but I didn't need all of that. Like, I felt like, like you were saying, I feel like they're being violent for the sake of being violent, and that's the, a violent match isn't always a good match. I think they can have compelling stories with without doing so much. Absolutely, it- they could have. St- they could have stopped it with the wood, but didn't. Yeah. Like they decided to be flashy and it's fucking gaudy. Yeah, like there there's no reason for it. like I understand that you want to be different for the sake of being different, but you have to be different in a way that still makes you different, but still keeps your performer safe. It I, I harpen back to what the Miz told Daniel Bryan on Talking Smack, one of the greatest promos of all time. I can do what I do all the time because I'm safe. You know, and mm-hmm. Daniel Bryan says, I don't like you because you're safe. And then Daniel Bryan is proving his point over and over again, you know, um, and listen, the Miz was right. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. the Miz is absolutely like, I'm doing what I can do because it's safe, because I have a family, because I can do this day in and day out and not get hurt and still provide for my family where Daniel Bryan's like, well, or Brian Danielson, I don't want to be safe. And this is what you get. You know, do you know how? You know, what was the telling thing for me, not the the cage match stuff. Because the cage match kind of speaks on itself, and but it was so bad. And I don't know if it's AEW doing this for kayfabe. AEW said we're not even showing the footage on our social media. You know, <laughs> um, but they're doing it to be edgy. They're doing it to be edgy. I get it. Um, but also, what was telling for me in that whole thing is after the Brian Danielson segment, because I know you watched All Out, right, Kay? Mm-hmm. Do you remember I watched it yeah, live. the Brian Danielson segment? After the segment was over, they panned to the four team announce team table, and I've mm-hmm. never seen such a divisive announce table ever. Shivani, yeah. like it's one of those things. I, I know Jr. We know that Jr. says no. Don't tell me what's going on, so I can react naturally. That's mm-hmm. always kind of been his mo. Uh, I don't know how Shivani does his stuff, or like Taz, or. Um, I forgot Excalibur. What's up, Excalibur? Yeah, I think Excalibur is excellent. I wish he was. I wish he could do more. I love Excalibur. I think it's absolutely excellent. But like Excalibur is trying to hold it together because he's pretty much the lead, the like the main guy. So I saw Shivani hand on head. Like, what did I just witness? <laughs> you know, and it could be kayfabe or not. Taz couldn't really look at the camera. He seemed kind of like, what the fuck, and. Judging by what we know of JR and his history of not wanting to know, JR was verbally disgusted at what he saw. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it was hard to watch. Yeah. It was, I don't know. It just like, it just, like I said, it's what I call yikes. They did so good. And then all out happens. This, this happens. This has happened the last two years with all out. Last year was CM Punk, or a couple years ago was CM Punk and All Out. Yeah. Um, and then this year you have the fiascos at the end, and they were doing such a good show. Like Osprey and Pac was great. Uh, MJF and Daniel Garcia was a good match. It was very. Good. I hated the ending because I thought it was really stupid for him to MJF to win and then Daniel Garcia to do what what the finish was going to be anyways. Yeah. Like that was my only gripe with the match. Like they were fine. Sheeta and Mercedes put on a put a good match. The crowd wasn't into it, but it was a good match. You know, uh the fatal four-way was fun, you know, and you had the best story ending the ending the day, and they went they just went too far. Too far. 
And I was like, why? Like, there's no reason for it. Like, Swerve just signed a big ass contract. He's like one of the one of the most lucrative contracts ever for I think in the history for an African American performer in the history of pro wrestling. Um, from you know what I've gathered, he just bought back his childhood home. He's number two in the PWI, and he's taking unprotected chair shots to the head. Like you, Swerve is on the cusp of being the face of that company. Yeah, for sure. You know, and like the pillar. <laughs> yeah. The pillars are changing. Yeah, he's on the cusp of being the face of that company. And, like, you can even see on his face, even if he was, like, kayfabe faking it or not. Like, he he looked in bad shape after that chair shot. No, he looked deeply at well. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, again, like, I feel, <laughs> I feel like this is the reason WWE has agents. So someone can be like, hey, no. Let's not do that. <laughs> Let's do something yeah, else. Yeah, I feel like Tony Khan needs a voice of reason, and he just has a lot of money and an echo chamber. Yeah, the the, the lunatics are running the asylum. Yeah, like Ugh, it's, I, it's concerning. Yeah, it's concerning. And if like if for some reason I don't wish this to happen to, but if for some reason AEW starts taking a nosedive, we're gonna all go back to this in a couple years and be like, this is the moment that people are like, no, we've had enough. Yeah. You know. I hate to say it, but like if AEW continues to go on at this, they're gonna have like an Owen Hart situation. Yeah, it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be catastrophic. Like, it, it really is. It's just unsafe. Yeah, very unsafe. So that, that was really long, long gated saying. That's what I call yikes. But moving on to our final segment, uh, we're gonna preview a little bit of bad blood. So, Kay, did you know? October 5th, 1997 is was the first ever Bad Blood and the first ever Hell in a Cell match where, yes, I, I did know that. Yes, that's got to be Kane. So October 5th, 2024, or yeah, well, not thir- it's Yeah, October 2024, um, not 30 years ago, but whatever. Uh, but it is going to be one of the anniversaries of Bad Blood. I want to say it's like 20... It's a it's an anniversary of Bad Blood, uh, but we are going to have. What year did you say? Nineteen. It was October fifth, ninety seven. Because ninety eight. Twenty seven years. Yeah, twenty seven years. Because ninety eight was Taker and Mankind. Ninety seven. Yeah. Ninety seven was uh, Undertaker and Shawn and the Kane debut. Damn. Yeah, so it's going to be the twenty seven year anniversary of that. Uh, it's going to be in Atlanta, and I believe. As of right now, it's a very Judgment Day heavy card. There's only like three matches. But the premier match, officially, Punk, McIntyre, Hell in a Cell. I think this is the only Hell in a Cell match on the wow, card. Wow, I love being right. <laughs> I said this weeks ago. <laughs> yes, this is a feud that deserves the Hell in a Cell. It's gone a main event. It's a B-level pay-per-view historically. But we are going back to kind of the roots of... Of what of what a Hell in a Cell match was. It was a feud to end all feuds. You're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. And I think if Triple H has his way, which I think he's obviously going to have his way, this is the only Hell in a Cell match on the card. And rightfully so. I hope so. So how excited are you for this to occur? Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I low-key have been fiending for Punk in a steel cage. So, <laughs> again. so like... <laughs> Go me. <laughs> and it's in Atlanta, so it's going to be on in a normal time, which means I won't be at work when this is on. Oh, that's right. Yes. I'll be out of work by 530 so I can watch Bad Blood. Yeah, you'll be out of work. Uninterrupted. Yes, because it is going on at 6 Eastern, actually. Thank God. And I'll tell Thank you God. why. It's because there's also a UFC event. And, like, they don't have to play nice with each other. They're just under the same umbrella. However, I understand why we're doing what they're doing. I get it. Yeah. So it's going to be an earlier than usual event because there's a UFC a card. It's not even happening in Atlanta, the UFC card. It's somewhere else. Um, I want to say it's actually in the Spear uh, in Vegas. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Or it might be this week is in the Spear in Vegas. I, I don't I don't recall. I remember seeing some that are going to do a UFC event in the Spear. Uh, but that's why it's going to be a little bit earlier than usual. I think it's going to be the pre-shows at 6. I think the main card's going to be at 7 or something like that. Uh, but we'll definitely find out about it. But I'm excited. I think it's going to be great. It's going to be a few down there. Our friend Charles is going to be in the crowd. Oh, you're going? That's so exciting. Charles is going. I am not going. Oh, I miss her. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm glad Charles is going. <laughs> I am not going. 
I'm not. Go- I thought about it, but I, I can't. I can't wield it actually because you know we got Comic Cons coming up, and I got you know got to put money towards that and shit and, and everything like that. Although, although we 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 we'll have to talk with Will about later on uh, in the month of September for uh, for a Grand Slam. Grand Slam. Yeah, I was I was t- <laughs> I was told by my boss that I need to take more time off, so now I have an excuse. <laughs> I we are Liv and I are both down to go. Just buying tickets after this week. The course <laughs> is getting fixed on Thursday. <laughs> and they are charging us an astronomical price for this fucking neutering. Choppy choppy. So I am on fina- so I am on financial hybrid issues <laughs> until next week. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it with Will at some point during during the week. Mm-hmm. But uh but yeah. But yeah, folks, that is the end of our show uh this week. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm so glad I was able to do it with UK. This was very fun and very refreshing and long overdue. Yeah, yeah. Let's do this again. Let's just kick Will off like a couple of times a times a year, <laughs> <laughs> so I can do everything in post and whatnot. But any final words, Kay, before we get out of here? No, I have a debate to watch. <laughs> You're the only one who's got a debate to watch. That. <laughs> my phone's no. All my friends are watching, and my phone's blowing up. So I have like serious catching up to do. Um, you can find me on social media at. What's my fucking handle? K I almost underscore, said BK Murphy. K underscore that hasn't fame. been my fucking handle in like over a year. Because you wanted to change K it. Unders- <laughs> because I didn't want my name to be my thing. Yeah. But yeah, don't look up my name. Look up K Fave. K underscore Fave. And go to Ricky. <laughs> Thank you for because mis- apparently shit's popping off. I'm just getting a lot of information at once. Yeah, we'll right go. We'll, we'll we'll cut the pre-show this week. We'll just go straight straight to the damn thing, ladies and gentlemen. You've been listening to Kings of the Rings podcast, episode number three hundred and eighty-nine, ex- uh, Elite Home Makeover. I have been your host, King Ricky Rose. You can find me on Ambassador Biggs across all social media outlets: B I G Z Ambassador Biggs, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Gram, uh, Twitter, Gram, Twitter, Snapchat, some people's DMs, less people's text messages: B I G Z Ambassador Biggs. Find Kings of the Rings podcast at K-O-T-R underscore podcast across all social media outlets. Like, share, subscribe, leave some five-star review, buy some of our fantastic merch, which I'm wearing right now. I'm in the I'm in the middle of actually re- rehauling a lot of our merchandise, taking some stuff out, putting some things on. I'm doing a whole revamp. I would love to help. You can help me reorganize. <laughs> it's actually I would love to help or I would love to help organize. I love to organize. Yeah, I I, I really need to reorganize a bunch of stuff. But it's going well so far. It's going well. We're in the we're in the infant style taste, but we're gonna we're gonna stuff is still on there. Links all about it in the description below. If you're listening to us or watching us, please uh do so on Wrestle Addict Radio, the cure for the common wrestling podcast. Follow Wrestle Addict Radio socials at addict underscore wrestle on Twitter and at Wrestle Attic Radio, all one word, everywhere else. When we come back next week, hopefully AEW hasn't done anything absolutely catastrophic. Um, but literally at this point, uh, no promises. We won't have a pay-per-view or anything to really predict, so it's just going to be a regular wrestling week, which is probably my famous last word. So until next week, folks, goodbye, good night. We'll see you soon. Oh, yeah, fuck you, Slack. But for one time, in the words of James Earl Jones, the voice of Lord Vader, may th- oh. may the Force be with you. Good, and also with you <laughs> from my Catholics up in there. Jesus Christ, K, okay, all that good. We'll see you next week, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. This has been a Wrestle Attic Radio branded podcast.